Hi, I'm Lizzie Paul. I'm the chair of the National Spectrum Consortium, and I would like to welcome all of you to our Tech Talk series. Today's topic is the Internet of Military Things, and I really look forward to the discussion led by our moderator, Brandy Vinson of NextGov, and our distinguished panel of experts who are also NSC members. Before I turn over to Brandy, I just want to say a few words about the National Spectrum Consortium. We are more than 400 plus members consisting of large and small businesses, traditional and non-traditional, academia and nonprofits. Our mission is to help ensure US competitiveness by solving the toughest challenges related to spectrum, wireless networking like 5G, and a broad range of advanced technologies. Working collaboratively with each other and with the US government, we develop and deliver innovative solutions for US economic growth and give our warfighters the decisive edge on the battlefield. For today's conversation, we are privileged to have Brandy Vincent as our moderator. Brandy reports to NextGov on the federal government's use of and policies of emerging technologies, including but not limited to supercomputing, AI, biometrics, and IoT. Brandy, we look forward to a great conversation. Surely it's going to be so interesting. And I can't wait. For so I would like to thank everybody here joining us today and enjoy the conversation. Ask a lot of questions on the chat and our panel will try and answer all these questions for you. Thank you, Brandy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm based in sunny DC over here. As you've heard, I'm Brandy Vincent, a journalist at NextGov covering the intersection of the government and emerging technologies. The Internet of Military Things, which we're talking about today, falls right in the center of that. And I am super excited for this conversation. Um, I wanna thank our panelists for joining us and NSC for having us. Um, we have a great panel here. They're joining us from all over the country. We've got Dustin Helwig, who is the CEO of Chesapeake Technology International, Melinda Taranjo, who currently serves as executive director and chairman of the board of RVJ Institute, Center of Excellence for EMSO, and Pete Fisher, the senior director of cyber programs at Sierra Nevada Corporation. Um, we're going to chat through a range of topics, uh, really getting to the operational opportunities and technical challenges, as we mentioned. And towards the end, we're going to open it up to you. This platform offers um, a way for you to submit questions. So submit those along the way. We'll be fielding them and we'll get to those. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick us off. I asked our panelists to start by giving you just a little quick snippet about their expertise, their professional passions, and I want them to briefly answer this question for us all, which is, I think, the core of our discussion today. Um, what is the Internet, Military, Internet of Military Things, or IOMT? So with that, I'm going to kick it over to you, Pete. Share your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you, Brandy. So, Again, Pete Fisher, Senior Director of Cybersecurity Programs at SNC. So Sierra Nevada Corporations is a DOD prime systems integrator. And as a prime systems integrator, that means we deliver a lot of capabilities across the military spectrum, air, land, sea, and this spans intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, communications, and a broad range of applications. So my role, and again, my passion, is protecting not only those deliverables, but protecting DOD's critical infrastructure across the entire enterprise. Um, my team likes to, my team really likes to be able to focus on delivering things like zero trust to the battle space. So moving on to the Internet of Military Things, um, you know, from our perspective, it's all about devices, it's all about systems, and it's all about sort of that machine to machine and that enabling automation. So so first off, I see it as a paradigm shift. I see it as, you know, with, with a vision that is as grand as connecting any system over any network at any time. And those networks being wired, wireless, or beyond line of sight, um, that's a whole new way of doing business for the DoD. 
So second, the, the scope is broad, right? The scope, the, the scope includes, um, and, and it touches things across the entire enterprise. So some, some just basic examples to, to kind of set the stage on that scope on the battlefield. This includes sensors, jammers, data links, um, weapon systems, right? And on the soldier, this includes intelligent body gear, wearable, wearable sensors, you know, more, more like the traditional IoT and even biosensors. Um, weapon systems, this includes unmanned aerial vehicles, sea vehicles, land vehicles. Um, but the other part that's kind of interesting about this and might actually offer the biggest, you know, immediate advantage is infrastructure. This also includes base infrastructure, logistics, equipment maintaining. And so basically the backbone that allows us, that allows the DOD to deliver their mission and be effective. Um, and so, you know, as we talk about, you know, going on, as we talk about some of the overlap between this and, and how commercial and DOD kind of overlap in the internet of lots of things, um, this kind of infrastructure has, a, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of parallels. That's great. Thanks, Pete. And I love sort of the window into a lot of things I think we're going to talk about um, in this discussion. Uh, Melinda, over to you. Tell us about uh, your expertise and sort of how you think of and approach IOMT. Well, I got my start on President Reagan's Star Wars, and that's how someone gets involved in electronic warfare. I was a laser research engineer at Wright-Patterson over 30 years ago, and it was an interesting poker game with Russia, but that's how I got started, and now I find myself the executive director of the only not-for-profit 501c3 center of excellence in the world, I believe, that is focused entirely on excellence in electromagnetic spectrum operations. The mission of the Institute is to raise awareness on the looming obstructed access and challenge in the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm sure we'll be talking about that a lot today. And on the heels of Pete's comment that uh, to Sierra Nevada Corporation, it's about the devices and the systems. I believe the IOMT is about the network, entirely about the network. And it is the network and sensors and devices that will enable EMBM, electromagnetic battle management. And that enables situational awareness so that the military can make decisions for command and control. And that actually, Brandy brings up a good moniker for most people. If you're wondering what that alphabet soup means, EMSO is the combination of electronic, electromagnetic warfare and spectrum management, and that enables EMBM, electromagnetic battle management, that is the network, the infrastructure and architecture and protocols that will enable all the devices to communicate. And then all of that data gets transmitted for JADC2, which fuses together all that information to make a very com compelling and trustworthy situational awareness picture. And then finally, that enables multi-domain operations, our ability to execute across domain, all the domains, and do it with confidence that we have accurate information. Thank you so much, Melinda. I really appreciate the overview. And I'm sorry I got a public safety alert right before that happened. Um, but I think that this is very much going to uh, sort of set the stage for the acronyms that we're going to dive deeper into. So I appreciate it. And last but not least, we have Dustin Helwig. Dustin, how are you? Tell us a little bit about your um, expertise, which I think is pretty unique, and how you are thinking about IOMT. Yeah, yeah, thanks Brandy and and first of all thanks to the NSC for, you know, having me participate in this panel and my auspicious uh panel members, you know, great intros and and I'll build on what they said as well. So, you know, yes, the devices and yes, the network, um but what we forget sometimes is that those things uh, go away sometimes and we still have to operate. So, you know, building on those concepts, the internet of military things is the aggregation of all these capabilities from the edge tying that into the enterprise and then leveraging the global cloud uh, to, to understand our environment. And I think what's unique about the Internet of Military Things is its utilization of Spectrum, since we're talking to the National Spectrum Consortium, and also its enablement of Spectrum uh, capabilities like EMSO and EMBM and, and all the things that were, were mentioned there. So, you know, CTI being the CEO of a, of a relatively small company building solutions in this space 
Um, we're, we find that we have to work outside of some of the traditional systems because this environment's moving so quickly and so fast. Organizations like MSC through other transaction authorities doing rapid acquisition and, and our ability to inject capabilities directly into the field and then update and maintain those capabilities in the field on a day-to-day -day or even an hour-to-hour -hour basis to, to be able to respond to not just our internet of military things, but other people's internets of military things because essentially warfare is becoming a battle of the internets of military things in, in a way. Um, and then also, how do we inform that commander through the battle management capability to understand this very complex environment? And that's really where all the fancy AI ML stuff comes in. Um, I'm convinced nowadays that if you write a proposal that says ML and 5G in the opening paragraph, you're bound to get funded, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what's out. <laughs> the world we're headed to. Um, thanks so much, Dustin. And I, I appreciate that. And I want to stick with you um, for this sort of first area we're going to be discussing, which is use cases and applications. Um, as you mentioned, CTI uh, deals with a lot in this space. I know you guys deal with complex data sets. I imagine there are volumes of those and growing. Um, but help us really visualize in ways that you can what IOMT applications look like on the ground maybe now versus in five versus in 10 years. Give us some examples of really how those applications could help military personnel on the front lines. Sure, yeah, and thanks for that opportunity. Um, you know, we are building those kinds of solutions today, and so I can describe uh, somewhat of what we are doing. Um, you know, I mentioned that, that tactical edge, the enterprise to edge connection, and then the enterprise cloud. You need all three of those for an effective internet of military things. And so what we've been building and fielding over the last couple of years very successfully is getting thousands and thousands of devices into the field that are able to collect spectrum relevant information, exfil that information in real time, in near real time, or in a disconnected sense because you can't rely on that network all the time or trust the network as Pete brought up. Um, you know, get that data into a cloud environment where then we can do the special stuff to understand patterns of life, understand um, anomalies within those patterns and then provide indications and warning, uh, not just to the battlefield commanders and the decision makers uh, in the beltway, but also to those edge users. Um, you know, we're asking them to carry things around, right? Wear things, carry things, put things in place uh, they, they are a critical part of the Internet of Military Things, and, and they deserve something back for doing that, right? If they're carrying an extra two pounds of weight, we need to give them some awareness at the edge. So we're also working applications that give them that uh, um, inherent immersive awareness through uh, wearables, smartwatches, through, you know, smartphone applications and, and things like TAC and, and their uh, end user devices. Uh, and then also, uh, the analytic product from the cloud going forward to tell them, hey, uh, you might be at risk right now. You can't rely on your navigation. You can't rely on your communications. Uh, that's what we wrap into a thing we call digital overwatch, um, very much like you think of military overwatch on the battlefield with aircraft ISR. Um, so, you know, that's today, that's real, uh, and that certainly feeds that picture into the battle management node at the combatant command or the uh, uh, theater operations center. Um, five, 10 years from now, you know, denser, more, and faster. You know, that, that, that if I could predict it in three ways, you know, m more dense utilization of spectrum because of all the great DSA things and, and other projects that the NSC is pushing forward. Um, faster because uh, with software-defined radios and, and light capabilities, they can respond and react as fast or faster than we can. And we, we have to stay in front of that, that loop. Uh, and then also, um, you know, more prevalent everywhere, just space, ground, sea, undersea, land, you name it. Um, Pete, I want to turn it over to you because I want you to continue to help us visualize IOMT applications on the battlefield, but also how they might translate over to the commercial sector. Um, is there anything you wanted to add there? So um, a couple of things there. So first, um, you know, I, I ended my list of, of IOMT applications with the base infrastructure. We've got an analogous in our critical infrastructure and what you call the internet of industrial industrial internet of things. So there's a there's a there's a really um, clear mapping of hey that same infrastructure we have across the commercial the, the commercial sector and it's very much you know it's almost like a one-to-one. -one. So some of the things that we do on the IOMT side 
in a lot of cases, especially my team on the security side, are going to map really well to, to you know, hopefully protecting our critical infrastructure. Um, another one, if it's okay, if I, if I could kind of tie into Spectrum Forward and um, some of the things that they're doing. So, you know, Spectrum Forward is part of the DOD's 5G to Next G initiative. Um, they're looking at accelerating the adoption of 5G and, you know, and beyond. Basically, commercial communication adoption to the DOD. Um, obviously, that comes with a whole lot, and a lot of us, I'm sure, um, Dustin and Melinda, we've been involved in this for quite a long time. Um, but I'm a big advocate of this. I really think this has this holds a lot of promise, and I love the experimentation approach. I really like the idea of setting up a sandbox, allowing people to bring applications to it, whereas, you know, NSC's first one that's out is telemedicine, right, and a variety of telemedicine applications. DOD is going to be rolling out, you know, over the five years, they're going to be rolling out all kinds of applications. Real-world applications, let's try to solve some of those real-world problems. And most importantly, and, and near and dear to our heart is, every one of these um, has a zero trust component to it. Every one of them has a security of like, okay, let's make this real, but let's make this practical too. Let's make this fieldable. Um, <clears throat> so again, commercial technology and, and things like this that are pushing that forward, um, as Dustin said, faster, um, more ubiquitous, everything like that. But commercial technology, I think, holds a key that allows us to break stovepipes, that allows us to take advantage of the enormous investment on the on the commercial side. You know, enormous investment. And and honestly, another thing that gets overlooked, it simplifies operations. It simplifies training. I'll give you an anecdote, and this is a little a little cheeky, but I'll give you an anecdote from from a 4G program we were working a while ago. So. A colleague of mine said, you know, you know, when, when we first bring people into the military, we take young tech savvy soldiers we, and when we put them on the battlefield, we take away their iPhone and we give them a walkie talkie. And, you know, it's an advanced walkie talkie. It's secure and it's got all kinds of features. And because of that, but it's still a walkie talkie and it takes them a long time to figure out. So. Um, his take was always, how do we get them back their iPhone? How do we make the iPhone work? I want to stick on that Spectrum Forward OTA um, for just a second. Uh, Melinda, I was wondering if there was anything else you could add about how you see it impacting IOMT over the next five to 10 years. Indeed, I do, Brandy. So the OTA is beautifully designed to accelerate acquisition and help the 5000 process, 5001 process make some progress. The challenge with that is really the 5001 process is really just a collection of lessons learned and the OTA hasn't really caught on. So what that will garner is a mosaic of solutions that represent the best of the technologies being developed today. And I'm not exactly sure I believe that that will ultimately build out the network, the ABMS, the, the IOMT infrastructure that the military needs for the kind of data that it is expecting to transmit. There's going to be a lot of inefficiencies there. If the DOD keeps postponing writing requirements, then what you're going to see are all of these devices being built to 5G and other commercial protocols, because what choice do they have? They're waiting for requirements. And I'm not exactly saying that requirements is a good idea either. Uh, those are rather an archaic approach to getting technology and capabilities into the military too, but we do have this burgeoning field of standards, SOSA and FACE and CMOS, and what's it going to be so we could somehow incentivize developers to build to standards and that might get us a little closer to an efficient network but ultimately we are going to need staggering amounts of bandwidth and speed and 5g and 6g while they are making promises i honestly don't think that will meet the demand uh, we are talking about way too much data and especially to my colleagues points about security and having confidence in that data so let's hope the ota gets a little further down the road but we really do need a structure around what this network should look like for confidence 
um, you know, government open software and open standards and open data access. I think those are three key pieces. You know, we as a company put every line of code we develop into government code repositories. I think that's a model that we need to show you can make money around and that it's to the benefit of the government as well as industry. Um, uh, but that'll facilitate that plug and play of best of breed capabilities as they emerge that that um, you know everybody's talking about here. And, and also that open data access. We have to start sharing the data that we are collecting because we, we need we need more and more apertures everywhere to be able to understand what normal looks like. It, you, you've heard me say probably that I don't think we understand what spectrum is and what it looks like. Oh, uh, we certainly so we don't. Sharing that data. Oh, I, I got to cut in there. Please. <laughs> so the, the, the Institute is on a mission of awareness. We simply must. Users must understand the vulnerabilities of using Spectrum and more importantly, the implications of not having it available to them. I cannot say it enough and I hope every listener will join our campaign. We must inform our legislators and decision makers around investing in capabilities like EP features on every Spectrum dependent system so that we have assured and ensured access to the electromagnetic spectrum. Quick thing that occurred to me, um, speaking about OTAs, a lot of the sort of work that I'm hearing around um, IOMT, IOT in general is around OTAs. Is that the main vessel that you think will continue to be sort of uh, used for this kind of work going forward? OTA is a great tool. Uh, there's other rapid acquisition uh, conduits and approaches I think that uh, are can be equally useful. Uh, we do a lot of SBIR based sole mm -hmm. source acquisition, uh, which which is greatly beneficial. There's previous programs like the Rapid Innovation Fund, uh, the Warfighter Lab Incentive Fund. Some of the DOD funded innovation programs are incredible programs. They need their funding increased, in my opinion. Uh, but definitely NSC and OTA, in my opinion, is is one of many great OTA conduits for doing this kind of work. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's yeah. also, oh, I'm sorry, it's often rapid compared to what sort of the traditional things are, which is the point I wanted to make to you. Melinda? Oh, just that we need to work around 5001. It's just not going to serve us going forward, given the speed of innovation. Cool. Um, I want to stick with you for a second, too, because before I came into this and before we were sort of preparing, I had heard a, so much about IOMT in the context of 5G, um, which is obviously come up here. What extent does developing military IoT tech depend on the availability of 5G, 6G, beyond? Um, will we even know all that's possible until we have 5G at a tech tactical edge? And are there other avenues um, that are important here? Well, 5G certainly does demonstrate we could get speed and bandwidth. As I mentioned earlier, both are critical. And without formal requirements, that's where industry is going to go. But if you're suggesting that I bring up, what if we took an entirely different approach? What if we didn't fracture the spectrum into ownership and bands and expect every overlord to maximize capacity in their own ownership band? What if we joined together and we threw out something that was completely novel, completely leap ahead, something like the Manhattan Project, where perhaps a non-stationary spectrum. So the Fourier transform came out in the early 1800s, 1830 or so, I think, and then Shannon's theorem came out in the mid 20th century. And the reason we've stayed locked in that standard for all of these years is because of compute, computing power. Now we are in a place where we can go to a non-stationary spectrum where instead of assigning sinusoids to symbol waveforms, we can assign polynomials this would introduce a tremendous amount of capacity to the, the network, but it would cause a great deal of stir in the industry and in the community because it would basically annihilate all of the standards we have today. But I think it's something that one day we are going to have to face, whether we look at it now under choice or we look at it in the future under duress. I'm just suggesting that we do need a different way to look at this, and now we have computing power to do it. Melinda, do you see that maybe as a as a commercial um, or a DoD specific type of application, or maybe both? Well, uh, consider this, Pete. It, by 2030, there will be five billion users on the Internet of Things with an average of 10 devices. That kind of demand, I think, is going to demand 
that the commercial industry adopt a, a, a standard of collaboration like this, where we switch over to uh, spiral modulation and polynomials. There's only one spectrum. Ah. Uh, doesn't but matter. Military, government, Fourier. commercial, it does foreign. It, there's one spectrum. But the Fourier transform isn't the only way to slice it. Exactly. <laughs> I love the conversation we have going on here. I want to pivot um, a little bit to sort of the challenge and barriers that the uh, DOD may face through its implementation. To start, I was thinking, Pete, I know that you focus uh, a lot on the security implications. Um, we're in the US right now already enduring some pretty major cyber incidents across federal entities, hospitals, uh, companies, and beyond. But as you guys are mentioning, IoT and IOMT is going to introduce so many new devices, which can also be thought of as threat vectors. Um, how are these being considered and, and what can you tell us about these security implications? You know, we've seen several attacks on U.S. critical infrastructure um, or what I mentioned before, the industrial Internet of Things just this year. Right. We had the Florida water hack. We had Colonial Pipeline ransomware. We had JBS Foods ransomware and and you know signs point to this just getting worse you know we've had we had energy secretary um granholm mentioned earlier that you know earlier in the month that our electric grid is at risk so so you're right there there is a real threat and again those are analogous systems to what we're talking about with the internet of military things um and so it, it also i mean some of the reactions to those those cyber threats have kind of shown how vulnerable these systems are these machine to machine or or another category of of thing is it's operational technology so how important it is to our daily life and you can think of there is that same backbone for the military right so so all of this stuff is um is very critical so bringing it back to iomt those same those same risks exist right the same risks that that you saw but but the thing is the stakes are even higher Right. When we had the colonial pipeline attack, we lost we lost oil for a while on, you know, and we had fuel shortages for a time. Imagine if something was to happen and we were to lose, um, you know, fuel at a base. We were to lose power. We were able to we were to lose those things that allow us to have mission readiness. Imagine if that was to happen and our adversaries were able to make that happen. Um, that's a strategic risk. And that's critical. Um, and so, and so, honestly, as part of this, you're exactly right. We're opening up more vectors. We need cybersecurity that can protect against all of these threats. Um, but the other important thing is, and, and the real caveat here is, they need to not impede the mission. You know, at the end of the day, if you have a network that is so safe that nobody can use it, it's also not really a benefit. So, um, you know, there's a balancing act. So we really need to look at things a little bit differently. Just just like Melinda and Dustin are looking at the spectrum, SNC kind of looks at, at the network and the cybersecurity a little bit different. So, you know, we mentioned zero trust. I mentioned zero trust a little bit earlier and, and um, likely everybody has heard of that. In fact, one of the nice things that Spectrum Forward is doing is they they put a zero trust requirement in every single thing that they're doing. So everything single solicitation involves zero trust. And it's up to those solicitors to figure out how to make that effective. Um, but, you know, we've all heard of zero trust by now, right? It, it's a household term. Um, you know, in fact, it, it's such a household term. One of my engineers the other day brought up the fact that his mom asked him, you know, hey, you're a cybersecurity guy. How do I get zero trust at home? Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, but, but what does that really mean? Right. And zero trust, you know, is defined by a NIST standard. And what it means is that you don't just accept an outer wall. You don't just say encryption is good enough. You don't trust anybody on the network. If, if, um, if I'm communicating with somebody, I don't trust that that message actually came from Brandy. I make sure that, that, Brandy's credentials are valid and Brandy was allowed to to actually send that message. Again, tying it into IOMT, we need to do the same thing for these systems. And there's a different approach to it, right? Um, we need to have an approach that that takes operational technology, mission technology rather than an IT system approach. You know, things like firewalls, things that that protect against um, 
again, protect our email, protect our services in the cloud. Those aren't the same things that are going to protect um, a tank in the battle space, that are going to protect our critical infrastructure. I just want to say that I think if we took a more prudent approach to how we deployed sensors to transmit all of this information, we may not have such a heavy burden of cybersecurity. So it would behoove us as we build out the Internet of Military Things to really consider the fidelity of the sensor and not burden the network so much with security uh, as far as, but rather make prudent decisions before we even begin to transmit. That might help the situation a little bit, just because we're dealing with such a staggering amount of data and so much security risk. I mean, it is a great point. Building integrity into the system is certainly one of those things, but how do you make sure that integrity is, is really true? So so those are the kind of things, and I think you know, out of what we're doing at Spectrum Forward, um, you're going to see a lot of initiatives like that. You're going to see you're going to see solutions where they bake in um, the ability for the military to operate through cyber risks and actually deliver capabilities regardless of whether the network's compromised or not. Absolutely. I, I'll add real quick. Mm -hmm. A great defense is a great offense, uh, and. So to protect our force and our infrastructure, we have to project our force and our infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, Melinda brought up Reagan earlier, and we we came to detente uh, with nuclear, uh, you know, powers, and we need to do the same way with cybersecurity in, in in many ways. We have to show that we are equally capable, um, and that means understanding the battle space. I'll come back to that again. That we don't effectively understand the battle space, so we're in a defensive posture because we don't know where our vulnerabilities are, nor do we know where all of our opportunities are. Uh, and so we have to do better at, at that pervasive understanding uh, so that we can hold threats at risk, uh, just like they're doing to us. I wanted to stick sort of with that idea um, of zero trust for just a second before we get into even more of the challenges, because I've been seeing uh, a lot of news around zero trust. I think I saw yesterday that CIS is working on new framework around that. Um, the DOD constantly says that uh, it or is in some ways promoting zero trust, especially as all these new devices are popping up. But if you're on the battlefield and say you're doing precision surgery, which telemedicine is an option here, and you're locked out, of something because of zero trust, uh, that's just as scary as it being hacked in the middle of surgery. So, is it on the com is it on the commercial industry to be protecting on that? Who does it fall on whenever, at the end of the day, it's on the battlefield? Well, I was only going to add that uh, I, I keep going back to my 83 year old godfather who just got a pacemaker, and he needs that to continue to transmit because if he starts to go into AFib, apparently it'll send back a pulse to save his life. And so- yeah, Does he have to two-factor authenticate that before it works? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so all of a sudden the network is becoming a matter of life or death. This it builds an even bigger case for why the demand is going to be so great. We're not going to be able to stay in our stovepipes. But I'll, I'll let you get back to the zero trust discussion. Just know well, that. I think we have to project the concept of zero trust to the physical layer too, which in this case is spectrum. You know, when you are passively receiving a GNSS signal into your GPS receiver, how do, how do you know whether you can trust that signal or not? We don't have. Uh, you know, if you're not on military grade G GPS, you, we don't have good mechanisms for trusting that signal. So we, we can't just think at the layer three to five uh, cybersecurity layer. We have to think of that layer one and two physical security layer as well. I 100 percent agree. I think any resilient, you know, we got to look at resiliency rather than just cybersecurity resiliency. Exactly like you said. Um, but just to just to put a pin in the zero trust discussion, um, I think one of the paradigm shifts that we need in the IOMT is to not think of, you know, for, so for devices, they don't really have logins and users and passwords, right? It's all about that real-time data. So you take a different paradigm shift. You allow devices to always be able to communicate. You just understand the, the domain that they're communicating with and the why they're communicating and you only allow them to communicate under those operational conditions that make sense. Um, think in the water, in the Florida water hack, to just to boil this down to a simple thing, right? There was no reason why somebody, somebody sent a valid command. There's no reason that they should be able to send, send something to set the, um, the, to set the chemical level significantly higher than is safe, right? 
there's logic that you can build in. You can you can bring together cybersecurity and logic to actually make that not possible. From what I've kind of gathered uh, in conversations with you guys leading up to this is that another potential hurdle um, in DOD's realm has to do with spectrum sell-off. Uh, does anyone uh, one want to give a little bit of an overview and sort of challenges presented here on that? Melinda, please. <laughs> spectrum sell-off means spectrum ownership. And while this has served us well for the last 80 something years, it's just not going to serve us going forward because we're not mutually collaborating on solutions for access. We need dynamic spectrum access schemes that are collaborative and communicative. Now, of course, this is going to, so the department is feeling the most pain right now because their pre precious coveted frequencies got sold off in recent years without their permission, and then they were just expected to adapt. If we had dynamic spectrum access capabilities now, like the polynomial waveform solution I proposed earlier, we would all be able to interoperate in the spectrum and not conflict. And so um, is there a way to adopt this approach? I don't know. There's a lot of infrastructure and mindsets in place right now, not to mention the billions of dollars that the telecom industry spent on owning those frequencies. But I, I think we're going to have to see an upheaval of some kind. I'll let my colleagues speak more to that. Well, and I would purport there is a way for us to do that. Um, and you know, we can we can do it within bands before we do it across all bands and at least learn uh, from those lessons and, and how to build out the infrastructure on uh, you know, either currently on licensed frequencies or on licensed ones that that people are willing to allow us to try that i like to think of it a little bit like um you know when you have to go in and rebuild a neighborhood using eminent domain it, it's a disruptive thing to do and it's difficult for people to understand why the government needs to do that sometimes but maybe we need to eminent domain some of spectrum and and do real dsa workable dsa solutions that are cooperative and non-cooperative because from a military perspective you need non-cooperative dsa solutions which has been a challenge because most of them require out of band coordination of some sort and that's always you know now we're back to the cybersecurity problem again um, so it, it can become a circular problem set but I, I think we can get there and, and maybe we need to just flip the game for a while and do it in bands where we can play freely and then uh, at some day in the future after we've eminent domained enough then we flip it a, to, across all bands Something I'm interested in covering uh, this domain and just emerging technology in general is the ethical and societal implications of these deployments. Um, IOMT is expected to maintain potentially a human-centric centric or man-in-the-loop approach due to its nature, um, which might involve eventually firing against targets. Uh, human identification and clearance for firing will always be necessary. Does that pose ethical dilemmas? Um, Melinda, I know that you've thought a bit about uh, ethical implications across all of it. What are some others that also accompany this um, and, and maybe how are they being confronted? So the Internet of Military Things is about enabling the flow of information. And when that's going to get dicey with the man in the loop or on the loop as the case may be is when we start automating c2 functions command and control functions we're not quite there yet but i definitely see an ethical implication there and i but i think a more sociological question is the the ethical obligation to advise every warfighter of the vulnerabilities of operating the spectrum. We're going to ask them to wear these Android Blue Force trackers and carry around whatever device is transmitting their data to the operations center for the situational awareness picture. But if we also don't, in concert with that, build a culture of awareness so they have an appreciation for what it means to operate in the spectrum and more to the point, when the spectrum is denied, I mean, I have seen, young, uh, well, maybe some old people too, but I was told by a professor that one student, when he told them to shut down their laptops, he passed out in class. We, we cannot have a meltdown when the, it, the network goes down and when the spectrum is not available. And we have to realistically expect that that is going to happen. Our adversaries have been planning for it. They have capabilities to do it. They've stated it publicly. And I also must impress upon the audience that we also have a situation where 
our adversaries can target singular cell phones. So if we have a warfighter who isn't aware of these vulnerabilities and they pull out their phone to call mom, they could instantly become a target and end up in a very, very bad situation. So I think more to the point, we have an ethical obligation to educate our warfighters on these vulnerabilities and make them very comfortable with the idea that if they don't have the network, we've provided them with TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures where they can operate with in graceful degradation, be it alternative frequencies, be it hand signals, be it continue until further, oh, whatever. Oh. We've got to get, get that. Dustin, were you going to add something there? I just said semaphores. We need flags to do that. <laughs> semaphores, right. <laughs> no, that's great. And I was going to stick with you anyway when it comes to ethics because uh, you, I think you have some pretty interesting thoughts on this judging by our first conversation, but how do you approach this work through the lens of Title X and how does that sort of play into the ethics conversation? We're all good Americans. None of us want to violate the privacy rights of other Americans. You know, I think that's kind of a, a myth that's out there in the non-defense, non-IC arena that, you know, everyone's trying to exploit people's personal information for government purposes. It's just not the truth. And, uh, but we do have a responsibility to abide by the rules. And when, you know, spectrum is one of those things that because of it, it's invisible and people don't really understand it, they don't understand where the line is drawn on privacy versus non-privacy. And I've always been a fan of saying, you know, if you're emitting an RF signal, your presumption of privacy is gone. Um, now, if I've encrypted the content uh, that I've placed on that signal, my presumption of privacy is intact. So it's kind of like when I mail a letter, somebody can pick up the envelope, read the address, look at the stamp, you know, do all that, even pull DNA off the stamp potentially. My presumption of privacy is gone, but they can't open the mail, right? They're not allowed to open it and read the content of the letter. And so we have to abide by those rules. We also have to abide by rules when we're operating in foreign nations uh, you know, during non-wartime conditions that we might pick up information that was emitted by a U.S. citizen in that in that place. But to me, it's really intent and then what you do with it from there. And, and if you're in a Title 50 environment and you're actually collecting for the purposes of exploitation, there's very strict rules on how you have to handle that data, how long you can keep it, where you have to keep it, the mechanism, you know, who can access it. But when you're in, in a war fighting condition and you're operating under Title 10, which I would promote, we're in a persistent phase zero war you know, right now, if not phase one. So we can operate under Title 10 authorities, which gives us a little more leeway on aggregating the information, still not exploiting it. We're not trying to exploit individual in, in, individuals' information unless they're cooperative in it, i.e. a military user that says, yes, you're allowed to have access to my position. Um, so so I, I think it's important for everybody to understand where those differences lie. Um, and I think we need clearer definition from the powers that be on where that presumption of privacy ends in the RF space. Because, you know, some of the national actors would tell you that all of it is private and other, you know, uh, commercial industry, you know, will tell you that almost none of it's private, um, especially if you opt in at the application level. Uh, so I think it's important to understand those delineations. With the time we have left, I will turn it over to our audience questions. We've got one here from Patrick. Has anyone done a study on how much bandwidth a matured battle space with a fully distributed kill chain of sensors would need? I mean, we've not done that study, but it's certainly something the Institute has stood up to do. Yeah, and I think it's a useful thing to do. Um, we're building a construct where you can associate um, operational intent with uh, transport requirements. So how do I associate all of those data elements that are required to minimally fulfill a commander's intent and then what transport medium or transport bandwidth do I need? And it doesn't just have to be RF, by the way. Um, I think it's a very useful thing to do. But, but as to my knowledge, nobody's done that completely. We are compelled to choke the speed with a human in the loop. Why bother? Will the adversary be squeamish and slow down their IOMT with a human in the loop? Hmm. It's a good point. I, I think a key there is what better means, you know, the definition of better. I think there are certainly situations where the machine can make faster and sometimes faster is better decisions. Um, context is very hard for machines to understand, uh, even in an ML space. Um, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, we have to fight in the same loop that the threat is, or we'll lose the battle. And I think that's the key, the core of that question, if I could be so bold to say that, um, which is why we have to have faster acquisition. That's why we have to utilize Spectrum more effectively. You know, all these things we've talked about, that's why, because they're doing it. <laughs> and if they're doing it, we have to do it or else we've already lost the battle. One more question. Do you think NSA type one secret level encryption protection is achievable for weaponized and classified data generating IoT devices? And I, can, I can give my opinion. I think in some cases it is. I think, you know, I, I personally think IoT and, and adoption of, you know, 5G and commercial communications, that's why the NSA has, has type two. That's why they have commercial solutions for classified. I think that's that is the big driver for it, but you know they could certainly get to it. the The better question is, do you want to? And and I think the answer is probably no. You don't or want to put in the effort. The you can, no. Yeah, yeah you could right. certainly get there, but um, you know I, I can give an anecdote about this. You might end up with a a first generation IoT device that's you know that that goes through Type One accreditation and and it's finally available for the battle space when the actual commercial version five is, is now available. In other words, you'll never be able to stay in tune with your commercial side. So um, while I think it's possible, I don't think it's, it's probably the direction they should consider going. The DOD has already emphasized the importance of spectrum sharing. It's doubtful that the telecom industry trusts the DOD to cohabitate within the same frequency band. How can we build this vital trust and get this concept to catch on? Is it possible without a domestic and international law mandating spectrum sharing and dynamic spectrum access? Well, it's certainly possible that it will take law. I will tell you that every awareness campaign is synonymous with education. And actually, uh, the Institute, RBJ Institute, got asked to stand up a, an informational page for US Congress and staffers to inform them of, of things going on in the electromagnetic spectrum, including the budget and legislation, NDAA, taskers, as well as just a primary understanding. Because, uh, well, in the words of my neighbor, when I said, do you know how your cell phone calls and emails get transmitted? And he said, I have no idea, the phone network. So we're dealing with a very broad range of comprehension. And so this is a very difficult topic to educate, but I honestly think when we're successful at doing that and the Institute won't rest until we are, we may not have to push and shove with legislation to make that happen. I like to think that if the, the right conversations are being had about these challenges and vulnerabilities, that people will come to their senses uh, and then we can use law as a fallback option. I'll definitely open it up to my colleagues for additional comment there. Yeah, I'll certainly jump in. Maybe this is another area we can use the term zero trust. Uh, why does that trust have to exist? Can we build an infrastructure that doesn't uh, require it to successfully operate? So. I'll steal from a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Bill Conley used to like to use the, the interstate or a highway as his metaphor for spectrum utilization. Uh, I'll add a caveat to it. I'll put a toll booth on it and I'll require that all drivers have insurance because why don't we just, you know, you pay to get on the highway. Once you're on there, if you bump into each other, your insurance company has to make a payment to the person you ran into. So why can't we have spectrum operate in a similar manner that when you do interfere, it's incumbent on you not to, but when you do, you owe somebody money because you just took money out of their pocket by infringing on their bandwidth. So I think there's mechanisms, and again, it comes back to that eminent domain and restructuring how we manage spectrum. Uh, we can build in those kinds of models that make a, a, a fiduciary uh, you know, model as well as a compensation model that would work uh, to allow us all to play together. Let's also go with EP features electromagnetic protection features on every spectrum dependent Bumper system. cars. <laughs> Let, uh, yeah, let's do it. I mean, this is a J, uh, JSID's requirement from the 2018 manual and the waivers have been getting issued left and right. We can no longer afford to do this. So one certain capability to at least uh, 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 ameliorate some of the collision expected in the spectrum is to have EP features, which makes things cooperate better. 
Many corporations are developing an AI chip to improve their processes. Do you see the DOD building its own chip to do the same? Note, chips could be built in the US. An important question as we continue to endure a chip shortage. I mean, it, it, it's a great idea. I, I'm always hesitant, just like the type one you know, solution. I'm always a little bit hesitant about the DOD providing, you know, providing something that then goes into the commercial market. Do I think it can happen? Do I think it would be a great step forward for, you know, like like they'd mentioned, you know, almost like the trusted foundry approach, right? And having it having it be, but I, I I don't think that's a realistic approach for everything. I think it's probably for just select applications. Um, but but it is a it, it's a novel idea, and I'm sure at some point it's it's honestly going to be put to the test whether it's viable or not. Um, I really want to take one more time to thank you, our audience, for these great questions and for spending an hour this afternoon with us. Um, and also thank uh, the NSC for having me and us and our great, great panels for this conversation. With that, I'll turn it back over to Lizzie Paul. Lizzie, back to you. Thanks, Brandy. I really enjoyed this conversation. This was really interesting, all aligned to what we do, right? Both as the US government and for NSC. So I want to thank you, Brandy, for being the moderator, and you did a, such a great job. It was so interesting. And to Dustin, Melinda, and to Pete, our NSC members, uh, for this very interesting conversation on a very um, uh, special topic and you know something that a lot of people are interested in, and many of them were dialed in, and good questions too. The, I really see that you know overall the realization of IOMT technologies and uh, applications requires what I heard is requires a lot of collaboration between different folks, whether it's our organizations as well as the US uh, government and so on, innovative solutions and out of the box thinking on spectrum allocation, usage and sharing. And Melinda had a lot to say about that, very passionate. And I all did. these are very much, all these are very much aligned to the NSC's mission to key, ensure US competitiveness in these areas. Uh, so thank you so much, and thank you to our members. Thank you, Brandy, for this very good conversation, and thank you for joining us, all everybody. Very good, very engaging. Thanks. <laughs>